Good afternoon and welcome to the Flag Day ceremony for June 14, 2016. We'd like everyone to please rise and salute the flag for the playing of the national anthem. Prior to beginning our formal recognition in honor of Flag Day, we'd like to invite the mayor of Wisconsin Rapids, Zach Vrewink, to say a few words. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome down to the banks, the beautiful banks of the Wisconsin River here in downtown Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, I pass by this site personally multiple times a day, whether it's on foot and car or by bike, uh, and I'm constantly reminded uh, of the position that this flag uh, pole uh, has in our community, especially uh, as it relates to our symbol of freedom and what we call uh, to this country to be uh, to be free. Uh, in light of Saturday evening's tragedy or Sunday morning's tragedy, I think it even holds a more special meaning to all of us uh, as Americans as we think about uh, what this country uh, has in terms of our freedoms and our and the many joys uh, that we have in living in a country such as this. So uh, again, welcome and uh, wish you all a happy Flag Day and uh, thank you all for, for your attendance here this afternoon. I would like to now call upon Wisconsin Rapids Elks Lodge number 693, Exalted Ruler, Marilyn Gillies, to lead us through the Flag Day services. Members and guests, the purpose of this service is to honor our country's flag, to celebrate the anniversary of its birth, and to recall the achievements obtained beneath its folds. It is quite appropriate that such a service should be held by the Order of the Elks, an organization that is distinctly American, intensely patriotic, and without counterpart. Esteemed leading knight, what are the fraternal aims of the benevolent and protective Order of Elks? To inculcate the principles of charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity, to promote the welfare and happiness of mankind, to uphold our country and its laws, and to quicken the spirit of American patriotism. Esteemed Lady Knight, what is the significance of the American flag? It's emblematic of the crowning virtue, charity. Esteemed Loyal Knight, what is the significance of the American flag? It is emblematic of justice for all. Esteemed Lecturing Knight, what is the significance of the American flag? It is the symbol of brotherly love. 
Lodge Esquire, what is the significance of the flag from the station of the exalted ruler? It is the symbol of fidelity. Charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity are the cardinal principles of the order and they are exemplified in all of our services. By them we teach love of our country and our countrymen and loyalty to our American way of life. To be an elk is to be an American citizen who lives for their country and is ready to die for it. The chaplain, please rise, the chaplain will lead us in prayer. <coughs> Almighty God, in this hour of patriotic observance of the birthday of our American flag, we ask you to bless our flag and the people of these United States for all that our flag represents both at home and abroad. We thank thee and that through all our history as a nation, it has been an ensign of freedom, liberty, and opportunity and through the years to come may this flag wave as the banner of liberty freedom and enlightenment may this service bring to each of us a sense of loyalty to our country and enable us to be better patriots truer citizens and more loyal Americans to thy glory and to the honor of this great nation. Amen. That we may better understand the meaning of our flag, I call upon Brother Kyle for the history of the flag. Heraldry is as old as the human race, the carrying of banners, has been a custom among all peoples in all ages. These banners usually contain some concept of the life or government of those who fashion them. The evolution of the American flag marks the progression of the government of the American people. From the founding of Jamestown in Virginia in 1607 until 1775, the flag of England was the flag of the peoples of America. In 1775, the pine tree flag was adopted for all colonial vessels, and this was the banner carried by the Continental Forces in the Battle of Bunker Hill. The southern colonies from 1776 to 1775 used the snake flag. In the latter part of 1775, the Continental Congress appointed a committee to consider the question of a single flag for the 13 colonies. The committee recommended a design of 13 alternate stripes of red and white with an azure field in the upper corner bearing the red cross of St. George and the white cross of St. Andrew. John Paul Jones, the senior lieutenant of the flagship Alfred, hoisted this flag to the masthead on December 3rd, 1775, and one month later it was raised over the headquarters of General Washington at Cambridge, Massachusetts, quote, in compliment, end quote, as he wrote to the United Colonies. This flag called the Continental Colors and the Grand Union was never carried in the field by the Continental Land Forces, but it was used by the Navy as its exclusive ensign and was the first American flag to receive a salute of honor, a salute of 11 guns from the Fort of Orange in the Dutch West Indies. In response to a de general demand for a banner more representative of our country, the Congress on June 14, 1777 provided that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes of alternating red and white and that the Union be 13 stars white on a blue field representing a new constellation. 
It was generally believed that in May or June of 1776, a committee consisting of George Washington, Robert Morris, and George Ross commissioned Betsy Ross, a Philadelphia Quakeress, to make a flag from a rough design they left with her. It is said that she suggested that the stars should have five points rather than six. This starry banner was first flown at Fort Stanwix, called Fort Schuller at the time, near the city of Rome, New York, on August 3, 1777, and was under fire three days later at the Battle of Oriskany on August 6, 1777, during a British and Indian attack. The first official salute to the Stars and Stripes was given on February 14, 1778, by France on the French coast when the Ranger, under the command of John Paul Jones, was saluted by the French fleet. This flag then carried by the Ranger was made by the young women of Portsmouth, New Hampshire from, the, from stripes of their best colored silk dresses and white wedding gown of a recent bride. It is said that this Ranger's flag was flown by Jones's ship, the Bonehome Richard, in its thrilling fight by moonlight upon the high seas with the British frigate Serapis. When the Serapis struck her colors, the immortal fame of John Paul Jones was ensured as the intrepid defender of the youthful republic. The original 13 stars and stripes represented the original 13 colonies. In 1795, two additional stars and stripes were added to represent the admission to the Union of Vermont and Kentucky. Under this banner of 15 stars and stripes was fought the War of 1812. It was the sight of it flying over Fort McHenry on September 14, 1814 that inspired Francis Scott Key to write what was to become our national anthem the Star Spangled Banner. Miss Margaret Young, who cut the stars for that particular banner, was the mother of Henry Sanderson, the grand exalted ruler of the Order of Elks in 1884. The Congress, on April 14, 1818, adopted a resolution that on or after July 4th of 1818, the number of stripes should be 13, and that the blue field should carry one star for each of the 20 states in the Union, and that a new star should be added for each state thereafter admitted. Since 1818, there has been no change in the flag design, except that 28 new stars were added before July 4, 1912. And this flag of 48 stars flew over this nation for 47 years until just before the Vietnam War. On July 4th, 1959, a star was added for Alaska, our first non-connected state. And a year later, Hawaii, our island state, added a 50th star. Our present flag, 50 stars and stripes, and 13 stripes, it is accompanied by the POW MIA flag to re recognize the plight and demise of a special group of our armed services, those who were prisoners of war or still remain missing in action. Exalted ruler. Right there. As this emblem is first in our hearts as loyal Americans, so is it close to our altar as loyal elks. The gentle breezes with lingering caress kiss the folds of no flag which can compare with it in beauty. There is no such red in budding roses, in falling leaves or sparkling wine. No such white as April blossoms in crescent moon or mountain snow. No such blue in woman's eyes in ocean's depth or heaven's dome, and no such pageantry of clustering stars and streaming light in all the spectrum of the sea and sky. Our flag is at once 
a history, a declaration, and a prophecy. It represents the American nation as it was at its birth. It speaks for what it is today, and it holds the opportunity for the future to add other stars to the glorious constellation. The benevolent and protective order of Elks is the first and only fraternal body to require formal observance of Flag Day. In July of 1908, the Grand Lodge of this order at Dallas, Texas, then assembled, provided for the annual nationwide observance of Flag Day on the 14th of June in each year by making it mandatory upon each subordinate lodge of the order. This unique distinction as the strongest promoter of Flag Day is most becoming to the Order of the Elks. This order is distinctly American. Only American citizens are eligible to join it and it has no foreign affiliation. It has linked its destiny with the destiny of our country and made this flag its symbol of self-dedication to God, to country, and to fellow men. The Stars and Stripes, flag of the United States of America, the worldwide hope of all who, under God, would be free to live and do His will. Upon its folds is written the story of America, the epic of the mightiest and noblest in all history. In the days when the peoples of the old world groveled in abject homage to the heresy of the divine right of kings, a new constellation appeared in the western skies, the stars and stripes, symbolizing the divine right of all to life, liberty, happiness, and peace under endowment by their creator. To what man or woman is given words adequate to tell the story of the building of this nation? That immortal story is written in the blood and sweat, in the heroic deeds and unremitting toil, in clearing the primeval forest and the planting of the vast prairies where once the coyote and buffalo roamed. Onward swept the nation, spanning wide rivers, leaping vast mountain ranges, leaving in its path villages and farms, factories and cities, till at last this giant nation stood astride the continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific. This is the heritage of the people of the United States. It has been repurchased by each succeeding generation and must be rewon again and again until the end of time, lest it too shall pass like the ancient empires of Greece and Rome. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. What was won at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill had to be repurchased at Ticonderoga and Yorktown. What John Paul Jones achieved upon the high seas in the War of Independence had to be repurchased by Commodore Perry on Lake Erie in the War of 1812. The prestige of Admiral Dewey's victory at, Mandela, at Manila Bay in 1898 was rewon by the naval battles in the seas about the far distant islands of the Pacific after the sneak attacks upon Pearl Harbor and Manila in 1941 had summoned our country to assume its role in World War II. What our troops achieved under the stars and stripes at Chateau Thierry and in Flanders in World War I, their sons were required to repurchase in World War II in the bloody trek across Northern Africa, on the beachheads of Europe, and in the Battle of the Bulge. The flag of our, our American men raised at Iwo Jima was the same flag later raised in the defense of Incheon, Pusan, and Porkchop Hill in far off Korea. And then another generation under the same flag bled to stem the threat of communism in far off Vietnam. Our young people were called to carry our flag in defense of the free world in actions in Grenada and Panama. Willingly, our brave men and women carried our flag and the honor of the American people into the battle in Operation Desert Storm. And who among us will ever forget 
the site of firefighters raising our flag over the ruins of the World Trade Center. The military personnel draping our flag on the side of the Pentagon or the citizens of Somerset County in Pennsylvania placing our flag near the site where brave Americans died fighting the hijackers of flight number 93. No other symbol could have offered such comfort as we still today endure the horrors of that day. Today, American armed forces carry our flag still yet in villages around the world, in the mountains of Afghanistan, in the jungles of the Philippines, and wherever terrorism may reside. Their struggle against the sponsors of terrorism has been the hardest yet of battles. This threat to our nation and to our way of life is th certainly as great a challenge as our flag has ever seen. The resurgence of patriotism since September 11, 2001 has rekindled respect for our flag. Today we see the Star Spangled Banner wherever we turn, on homes and businesses, automobiles, and billboards. Such displays stimulate our love of our nation for what it stands. They remind us of the sacrifices being made by the men and women of our armed forces around the world. They are a tribute to the heroes of the police and fire departments the nation over. The greatest significance of the flag, however, lies in the influence it has in the hearts and minds of millions of people. It has waved over unparalleled progress of the nation in developing democratic institutions, scientific and technological knowledge, education, and culture. It has served as a beacon for millions of poor and oppressed refugees abroad and stands as a promise that the underprivileged will not be forgotten. What is the meaning of the flag of the United States? There can never be a definitive answer to that question. There are people in this world who see it as a symbol of imperialism. Others see it as a destiny of the people. But reference to these and similar views of the flag was resolved by Woodrow Wilson when he said, this flag, which we honor and under which we serve, is the emblem of our unity, our power, our thought, and shape of this nation. It has no other character than that which we give it from generation to generation. The choices are ours. Only love, true love of our fellow man can create peace. The emblem and token of that love is the stars and stripes, the symbol of the American way of life. Our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing, long may our land be bright with freedom's holy fight. Protect us by thy might Great God, our King, exalted ruler. Lodge Esquire, how shall we further honor our flag? The flag is, for, the flag is formally honored by the Pledge of Allegiance. This pledge was written in 1892 by Francis Bellamy and published in the Use Companion as part of a patriotic campaign of that magazine. The pledge did not become part of the flag code until 1942, and in 1954, the phrase, under God, was added. Let us all stand and pledge ourselves never to forget the principles re represented by this flag. May we all stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge to lead the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
In conclusion of this observation of Flag Day, let us rededicate ourselves to the flag of the United States of America and may the principles of charity, justice, brotherly love and fidelity ever increase in each of us. I would like today to thank all of you for attending, especially Mayor Verwing, American Legion 442, the fourth degree of the Knights of Columbus, Veterans of Foreign Wars 2534, and the Vietnam Vets of America 101. I now declare this service closed. Order,